What's up, everybody? I'm here with Mo, my good friend. And you know when you see Mo on the channel, it's going to get deep. It's going to get interesting. Or at least you'll have a good laugh. Now, I've been getting this question a lot about, well, how do you get your first gig? Because it seems like people are stuck at the gate. The gun has gone off. Everyone else is taken off on the track and you're still inside the gate. Like, come on, feet. Don't film me now. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So I want to take us back in the way, way back machine. I want to take you back, Mo, to the first time you got your very first lead. I want to examine it. I want to unravel it and unpack it for our audience. And then I will also share with everyone how I'm able to get leads, how I'm able to start new businesses, and hopefully you can learn something from it. Hope you stick around for it. Okay, Mo, what's the first professional creative gig that you got? My first professional gig was actually doing photography for a boutique fashion store in my city. How did they know that you did this? I started my journey right after teaching college, after getting my master's a few years, public speaking in particular, but I just wasn't, the fulfillment was not there at the time. I did not like the academic structure. So I personally started making making vlogs at the time on Snapchat. And from those vlogs, I built a relationship with my former business partner, Christopher Franklin, who has been on the channel before. And I went up to him and I was like, yo, I want whatever you're doing for people for me. I want headshots. I want the whole thing. I will pay you for your work. I respect your work, all that kind of stuff. So I was like, I want to shadow you. He was doing wedding photography, wedding videography at the time. And I did just that. He was the one who had that boutique as a client. And then from there, he used me for his overflow. So just by shadowing him, learned the craft, did my own studying, YouTube university, so that's how I got the first one. First, first one. So did you tell me you snaked a client from your friend? No, see, you do that thing. You do that thing. No, I didn't snake a client. I got his overflow. So for people who may not know the word overflow, you describe that in a different way. Chris was a solo shooter, solo videographer, solo photographer. So he only had so much capacity, bandwidth, time, however you want to put it. So he could only take so many shoots in the span of one week. And from there, when he didn't have the capacity to do it, he called me up and he was like, hey, the boutique needs a photographer. Let's distill this into an actionable strategy now. You're in a very different place. How many years has it been? Uh, five. Five years since that first moment? I think okay. so. Damn, yeah. Oh, you moved pretty quick. All right. So <laughs> when you say I was really young back then, I was like, no, you're still young now. So Mo, five years, six years out, how could you replicate this exact strategy in order for you to generate leads now? Because everybody's like, how do I get a lead now? Not to recreate the entire process, but what you did was you went to a rival or a mentor, built a relationship with them and picked up their overflow work. That's a real strategy. What, if anything, could you use today in, in a real way, not just like some fictional hypothetical thing. I'd go to an agency who is credible in the business, who knows what they're doing in something that is adjacent to what I'm doing. We'd probably either pitch a project that we can help them with the clients that they're working with, or I would do it for free in the beginning and let them know like, hey, I exist for what you need. If what I have, well, I would know if what I have helps them to better serve your clients and then just continue to nurture that relationship. If I had to do that right now. I'm gonna tell you to do something right now. The first thing I'm gonna ask you to do, it should not be adjacent. It should be literally what you're doing now, but just at a higher level. So everybody get your pens out. Make a list of five companies that are doing what you do at the level in which you'd like to be doing it at now. And what I want you to do is to stock them everywhere in social. <laughs> follow them everywhere, listen to all of their podcasts, to engage with them in a meaningful way such that over a period of time, they get to know who you are and become naturally curious about you. At some point, if you're able to build some rapport, when it becomes natural for you to do so, not obviously on the first interaction, that's a terrible time to do it. Say, I'm a young and up and coming version of you. If there's ever an opportunity where you get too much work and there's overflow, I'd love to be able to service your clients. I'd be willing to pay for those leads. So can you think of five people who are working with the kinds of clients that you want that are making that kind of money that you want to make doing the kind of creative work that you want to make where you can actually literally follow this plan you need to first form the intention in your mind like i want to work with people then you need to express that intention out into the universe so that people who want to help you who can help you will help you and then you're going to organically bring them into your circle your orbit and then you can build a relationship with them. This is a really important thing. So a lot of us have dream clients that we'd like to work with. Problem is we aim too high. You just graduated school. You're like, I'd love to work with Nike. I wanna do something for Xbox. And Xbox doesn't know you from a fly on the horse poop. They just don't know. You're just another person out there. So what we want to do is we want to reach a little bit beyond where our hands can grab and start working with them and build a relationship and then develop some work. And then you just keep reaching a little bit higher. I find that one of the most natural ways to sell is just to tell people what it is that you're thinking. If you love a brand, tell them that you love them and express your creativity and say, I would love to work with you. One of my friends, he does this project where he does like one fictional project uh, every year and he loves Southwest Airlines. I don't know why, but he 
does. And so he went through and redesigned all of their touch points. And he did this thinking nothing would come of it. The next thing you know, he's working with Southwest Airlines. That's how this works. <laughs> It's how it works. I'll show you how I would do this exact same strategy right now. So I have to figure out how do I find a rival or vendor or a mentor who has the kind of clients in the body of work that I'd like to work with and say, I'd like to pick up your overflow of clients. Now, I don't have the exact same situation because I don't really have clients. But what I can do is to find people who are in mastermind groups who teach a specific thing that is different than what I teach. And I would like to be able to be in front of their clients, their members, and say, if you find what I do valuable, I'd love to see you in my mastermind where I teach people how to develop their brand, how to innovate their business, and how to do it in a fun, creative way. And so now I put that on the universe. Everybody will now know this is what I do. <laughs> see how that works? Facts. Now I'm going to share with people how I got my first clients or how I get clients every time I shift industries. It is kind of difficult. And then you listen with the intention of how can I replicate this today for my business and on behalf of our audience. And that way we'll try to make this as actionable as possible. And it seemed like work comes to me pretty easily. So it's going to annoy some of you. <laughs> I just already know it. Okay. So let's just deal with that part. My first mini big break was I drew a lot in high school, so I created a small reputation of someone who liked to draw. So word gets around because I was making illustrations for the newspaper staff, and I don't know how they found out, but they were like, can you draw this? I'm like, sure. So eventually it gets over to my brother's wrestling coach, my younger brother's wrestling coach, and you're like, what does this have to do with anything? Well, then he said, does your brother want to go and work for a friend of mine who runs a silk screening company as a designer? What you can find out from a couple of these things is if you practice your craft and you are able to get it out into the real world. This is why I say quantity over quality if quality never happens. I'm just doing work. People find out about it and people in your orbit, your friends and your family and friends of family and friends of friends will let other people know they're looking out for you to become an official salespeople for you. I'll jump forward now. Okay. Now I'm in college and I establish a reputation amongst my classmates that I'm a designer. So photographers who need to create promotional materials for their portfolios to send out to agencies and reps, they lean into me. It's like, can you help me with this? At people who are in the advertising department reached out to me. I think they did this because I had a reputation of being an exceptional designer. And I say this and I'm repeating this couple of times because many of you want work. How do I say this? But your work sucks. It's just not good. It's not even at the level in which I can recommend you, right? So people are like, hire me, hire me. And I look at your work. It's like, there's a reason why you have to ask people for work because your work is terrible. Mm. Objectively speaking, it's terrible. And then you say, well, Chris, that doesn't help me out at all. Because if I suck, then are we just doomed never to make any money? Well, if you keep taking that attitude, yes. So what you need to do is you need to say like, this person's work, I admire a lot and identify objectively what the gaps are between where you are and where they're at and do everything in your power to close the gap. I would start by first, quite literally, copying all of their work. Really understand because then you'll start to learn like this is how they make decisions. And then the next assignment that you get, try to apply those same principles and that thinking to improve your work. If you do this consistently enough, people will seek you out. That's the bottom line. The better your work, the less you have to market and sell. If your work is so good, you won't have to market and sell at all. And we're not gonna get there on day one, but that's the ultimate goal. So now I'm looking for opportunities. Well, at school, at Art Center, they post job opportunities all the time. And so I just pull those tickets down, I apply to them, show my portfolio, I get the work. So work is abundant if you're good and if you're willing to do the work necessary. But so many of us are just sitting there thinking, if I wish it enough, it will happen for me. And I gotta tell you something, friends. I've wished to have a six pack for a really long time. If I don't put in the work and the discipline, it doesn't happen by itself. There's no magic there that's going to happen. Right? You actually have to work for what you want. So put in the time. I get out of school. I have an opportunity to showcase some of my work on Adobe's After Effects CD-ROM. And I've cut a demo reel together. So that CD-ROM goes out. That works as my marketing material to generate leads of people who are interested. The way I got to work with the legendary Kyle Cooper, who does main title design, was because one of my very good friends from school was dating him at the time. And she knew that the two of us would get along because we have a way of looking at the world. You see a consistent theme here, everybody? That happens over and over again. I'll pause here most for you to dissect and pull apart any actionable things or questions you might have. Okay, okay, okay. 
I figured out the five C's after our little back and forth. If you are still early in your journey and you want to replicate either how I got clients or how Chris got clients, number one is still choose. You have to choose what it is that you want to do, what your focus is. Number two is you got to commit to that choice. If you think about some of the stories that Chris has said, a year long commitment into that choice without any ROI return on investment, but that eventually because of his, for lack of a better term, delusion in the vision yielded that return. The third one is craft. You have to be a practitioner of what it is that you want to be known for. You start by copying the person that you are learning from. You combine that thing that you've learned into your own style and then you create. The fourth one is you got to claim it. You got to claim what it is to you do first for yourself. This is where the confidence comes in. And then externally to the world, this is where the marketing comes in, whether it's inbound, like in Chris's situation or outbound, like you're knocking on doors, you have to claim it. And then the last one is capital. If you did the first four well, then inevitably it should turn into some moolah. Pretty good. I like that. <laughs> so I'm going to do one last thing before we get out of here. I'm going to jump forward in time because those seem like real basic beginner types of things. I hope people will find to be useful. And before I get into the last bit, take this opportunity to go ahead and hit that like button and leave a comment because it'll help us with the algorithm. You know what to do. You've done it before. And we truly appreciate that. When you pivot, when you do a hard pivot, which many of you are potentially in that position now where you've been known to do one thing and now you want to do something else and it's very difficult to reposition yourself. That did quite literally happen to us. We're working with advertising clients. We have sales reps. I want to do brand strategy, identity design, marketing communications, Marcom stuff. And this is very different because we're used to working with an agency as their intermediary between the client who figure out the strategy, write the copy, sell it through. But now I want to work with clients directly because I just want to have access to different types of clients. And so the way I wanted to do was to lead with brand strategy, something I had just learned how to do. And for the period of about a year, anybody that was willing to talk to me about doing work together, I would do a soft pivot. So we had the body of work. As you said, Mo, it's kind of important for you to keep doing what you're doing to keep the money flowing. Yeah. So people would call upon us and say, hey, yeah, I think I need a video made. And they knew that we could do that. I said, great, come on to the office, let's talk. And here's the line that I would use with them. I know you're here to see us or talk to us about making the video. But before we do so, I find it helpful to engage with our clients about their overall strategic business objectives. So I can make sure that if it does require a video, we know what we're doing it for. And if something else should come up, that we're able to address that. Would you be interested in doing this? Of course, they're going to say yes. It seems like you've got a good head on your shoulders. That's where I say, now normally when I run these sessions, my clients will pay me $10,000. I want to do something for 45 minutes. It's free. This one's on me. You find this to be helpful. If you want to proceed with us, we can talk about an engagement later. So I'm addressing all their thoughts and their concerns. Why are we mm. doing this? What are we doing? What is the value of this? Are you trying to sell me something? And I just address all those issues right up front. I did that for about a year, putting the price tag at $10,000 to have someone pay me to do brand strategy for them. I got a lot, a lot of responses like, that's too much money. I don't think we need this. I don't know if we can afford it. What am I getting again? And I did this for a year while maintaining my original business, my original clients. And eventually someone said, yes, that makes perfect sense. And then we're off to the races. The funny thing is, it's really hard to get your first yes. But once you get your first yes, it leads to that whole confidence thing where they get more value than what they paid you to do, you start to believe in this idea that you have, and now you can go out and sell even more. It takes a year to sell our first engagement for 10 grand, quite literally a year. But the next one came in weeks. The next one came in days. It just became easier and easier, and we were able to increase our brand strategy service from 10,000 to 30,000 to over $100,000 as we grew into this phase. It was wonderful to do. So let's peel away the layers, Mo. How does someone replicate this? All right, here's what I think. To kind of summarize that, if you're already in a position where your craft and your professionalism and your tenure can speak for you, I think at that point, it's just a level of confidence to introduce this new thing that you're doing. And that's all it took from you because you had the flow of leads, you had the flow of customers inquiring for your business, and then you just gently introduce them to this new concept. But for that to even happen, it's just the confidence to introduce it to the person. That's my takeaway from that story, personally. You would be missing a lot of the finer points there. As good as I think I am, as, as well connected as I am, it takes a year of just pitching one after the other and hearing no after no after no. And I got a lot of counter offers. Do it under this way, for this long, for this price. And every single one of them, I said, no. So Stuck good. to my guns. You can try this, Mo. 
I mean, you've been in business five, six years. So if you spent a year of your life trying to achieve some result, whether you wanted to be a public speaker, an entertainer, whatever it is, give it a year, really working at it, and then tell me what it is, because that would be 20% or 18% of your entire business career that you would spend trying to achieve this. And of course, along the way, people are like, what are you doing? Why do you think this would work? How'd you arrive at this idea? I'm like, it doesn't matter. I don't want to explain it to you. I'm not going to prove anything to you. You'll see. Mm. You'll see when we're there. And as soon as we get there, all those naysayers either disappear or like, I knew you can do it. I knew this was going to work. They always do that. So I just didn't sit there for a year and just imagine like it happening. I read books. I watched videos. I attended workshops. I sought out mentors and I figured out like, what do I need to do to make this happen? I kept pushing and learning until I was a person who had this skill set that someone would say, yes, this sounds like a good idea. And that's only the beginning because once you get yourself into hot water like that, you have to learn even more because now someone's committing real money and your professional reputation is at stake and I don't want to risk that. That's what it is, by the way. This is a meta lesson right here. I want to be careful to say this generally, but like people are scared to put their back against the wall when it comes to that moment. That's why it's much easier to just live in the pondering or hoping someone intuits that you want this because the second that someone paid you you're on the line now i have two questions for you on this what is stopping people from making that jump to commit for a year to something that they have a vision on let's just start there and then i'll ask you the second question i suspect that their self story isn't one where every single time they commit to something that they get the results that they want. Whereas my self story is every time I commit to something, I always get what I want. And so it begins there. My wife's always asking me like, how do you know this is gonna work? It's like, when has it not worked? And when it doesn't work, I just change the plan a little bit until it works again. Like I'm so committed to this new mastermind group. I can already see the hundred people who are signed up. And then I can already see what I'm gonna do with the money that's generated from this and the experience I'm going to be able to deliver. I'm already four, five, six steps ahead. It's what happens when this other goal that people see, feel like it's not going to happen. They lack faith. They lack the conviction to see this all the way through. And when you open the door for doubt to come in, doubt comes in. I always have a problem, right? So let me just share something with you. Anybody that's ever worked with me in the entire history of my professional career has learned something about me in that I don't have a lot of room to try to convince people why they should work with me. I have supreme confidence that what I'm doing the price in which I'm doing it for is a bargain. So why people get stuck? Why don't they commit? I don't know why. Something's obviously holding them back. They don't believe in it enough. And we're all tested at different times in our life. Sometimes we take that step forward and we pass our test. Sometimes we don't. I don't know why. I think you answered the question. It's that undeniable belief in oneself and committing to the fact that you will deliver in excess of what you promised when it comes to value. But it starts with that belief piece, which brings us back to landing this plane. Wait, wait, wait. Be Before you do that, you said there are two things. Well, you answered the second thing. thing, so I'm not going to be redundant about it. Right. It's the, the second thing was how to make sure when you are in the position where someone says yes, that you don't fumble the bag. And what you said was it's because you feel like it's a bargain and that you know because of how you are wired professionally that you were over deliver on the value. So there's never an option for you to not get that desired end result or, or let doubt creep in. Let me ask a question of myself that you didn't ask me, but I'm going to ask Please you. Please do right. it. Yeah. The question is, how can you know you're going to deliver more value than what you're paid? Where does this supreme confidence come from? This belief in oneself? Because that might be a big unlock for some people. Mm. So I'm going to answer that question, obviously, with a question. <laughs> Okay, before I tell you the answer, which is I want you to take inventory of your life and what you do with your time, because that's all we got. We got this few precious hours every single day to get us towards our goal. I want to ask you, when you have a moment when you're not working, when you're not taking care of your responsibilities to your partner, to your children, to your parents, whoever it is that you have some responsibilities towards, what are you doing in your free time? And that will tell you a lot about why I have supreme self-confidence and why you might be lacking. I give you some options about what people do in their free time. They relax, they sit on the couch, they read a magazine, they do a crossword puzzle. So people get caught up in routines because routines give us some comfort because it's a known thing, it's familiar to us. Mm -hmm. And if you were to look at me like, Chris, what are you doing? I'm constantly trying to be a better person. Person. So you'll see like there's a lot of house projects that never get done at the house because it's actually very low on my priority list. I've got books I need to read. I got people I need to talk to because I want to surround myself with people who inspire me, who challenge me, who know something I do not know. People think I do the podcast because I want to go up in the rankings of the podcast. That's a result. That's a result of something. It's not what it is I'm trying to do. I'm trying to have conversations with really smart people and ask them questions that help me solve a problem. 
and I take our audience along the way. And I think they benefit from me asking the question that they're thinking themselves. So I'm constantly working on myself because they do not know when or where, but what I learned today, what I learned yesterday will pay off. So I don't think this of myself. I don't think I'm some great reader, but when I get onto podcasts and people interview me or on Instagram lives, they're like, how you, how can you remember that concept from that book? I read that same book. I don't remember it. How do you, how are you able to cite this book? And they're like, their conclusion is they need to read more. I don't think they need to read more. They need to read better because it's not a game of volume. It's a game of depth. How well can you understand something such that you can explain it to other people without notes, without rehearsal, without preparation? This is really important. I've become insanely or radically curious about the things that I'm curious about. And that's what I'm doing with my spare time. And so I already know this, Mo. There are a few problems that you're going to come to me with that I can't figure out either on the spot through dialogue with you through a little research or punt it for two weeks. Let me do my research and I'll figure out an answer for you. And if I can transform your life and your business, your relationships, your communication, your mindset, your confidence, I know that has a value to you. I want to share some words of encouragement because I know getting that first client, that first big break is very, very difficult. But for you to be committed to be uncompromising and wanting to get that result and putting in the time the work necessary to get it it doesn't mean that everybody that has a goal and is committed to it is going to get it because i think they haven't put in the work i see it all the time in my dms where you say i do this and i look at the work and it's actually not very good at all mm. and so it means that you're expecting something to happen without having to put in the work yourself the greatest investment that you're ever going to make in your life isn't in the dow and jones or standards and poor market it's not in gold. It's not in crypto or Web3. It's in yourself. Work hard on your job and you have a career, as Jim Rohn has said. Work on your personal development and you'll have a life.